Thank you very much, Alan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to welcome you to this annual Law Day Moot Court Law Review Banquet. Those of us that have spent a number of years in academe become keenly aware of the fact that excellence in legal education is largely the product of individual student self-help. The valuable learning experiences of moot court competition and law review research, writing, and editing constitute essential ingredients of a quality legal educational program. Since student activities of this type reflect the measure of an institution, I'm pleased to report that the state of the Georgia Law School is excellent. During this past year, Georgia entered 25 competitors in eight moot court competitions. The two intra-school competitions, the Russell and Talmadge rounds, involved over 200 students. The out-of-school competitions included the national competition sponsored by the Younger Lawyers Committee of the Bar of New York. Our team, after winning the regional competition in the southeastern region, finished ninth in a field of 140 in that competition. The Philip C. Jessup International Law Competition was held this year in New Orleans, and our team finished second nationally. The Wagner Labor Law Competition held in New York in March of this year, our team finished fifth nationally in the national finals. For the first time, the Moot Court Board entered a team in the Holderness International Competition in Chapel Hill, and our team finished third. The American Bar Association Appellate Advocacy Competition and the intrastate competition were the other two out-of-school competitions entered this year. And I'm very pleased that our team brought back a resounding victory over Mercer and Emory, winning not only the best brief, but the best oralist in the interstate competition. I'm also pleased to report, uh, insofar as the law review is concerned, <coughs> that Volume 11, Issue 5, the Jurisprudence Symposium issue, which was centered around the Sibley Lecture of uh, Professor H.L.A. Hart, has sold over 300 reprints in more than 13 countries. Also, we're told that at least two law schools in this country are using that symposium issue as a textbook in their jurisprudence courses. One measure of the quality of a publication such as the Law Review is its acceptance in the legal community. The, the Georgia Law Review this year has acquired more than 100 new subscribers and continues to send complimentary issues to all of the federal judges throughout the country. It also continues to be one of the most cited reviews in the country according to a recent North Carolina survey. Quality is certainly the hallmark of this most important aspect of our educational program. Another fact that I think you'll find significant this year is that the law school has placed a record number of graduates in federal <coughs> clerkships. Four of our students have received clerkships in federal courts, federal courts of appeals. Two in the second circuit, that's the circuit that covers uh, New York in that area, two in the fifth circuit, and three of our graduates will be clerking with federal district judges in this region. And I think it's important to point out that all seven of these students are members of either the editorial board of the Law Review or the Moot Court Board. The importance of activities such as these to students competing for clerkship positions is well demonstrated by this year's statistics. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce the chairman of our moot court board, Mr. Gordon Smith, who will introduce our speaker. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our guest of honor tonight entered the United States Senate not quite six years ago. Yet in that time, he has established himself as a worthy successor to the late Senator Russell. Perhaps his most visible accomplishments have come from his assignment on the Armed Services Committee, where his investigations of NATO 
have led to major restructuring of U.S. forces in Western Europe. But Senator Nunn's accomplishments are not limited to armed services. He has been instrumental in major legislation aimed at attacking fraud and abuse in federal programs, in cracking down on drug trafficking, and in aiding small businesses. Recently, Senator Nunn cast one of the crucial and deciding votes on the Panama Canal Treaty. As Dean Baird noted in a recent newspaper column concerning that vote, in national politics, the true test of courage is to vote one's own convictions on a controversial issue with the future good of the nation in mind and not to be swayed by the emotional rhetoric of the moment. Ladies and gentlemen, the Georgia Law Review and Moot Court Board are proud to have as our guest tonight, Senator Sam Nunn. Thank you very much, Gordon, President Davidson, Dean Beard, Dean Rusk, Congressman Stevens, Congressman Bernard, President Spahn, Editor Dye, again, Chairman Smith, other distinguished guests, state, county, city officials, judges, who I noticed uh, by coincidence always got the loudest applause in this audience, <laughs> <laughs> members of the faculty, students, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to have a chance to be back on the University of Georgia campus, particularly delighted to be here on a day and a night that the Moot Court team has been so active. I participated in the Moot Court activities at Emory Law School back in 1961, and I might add, uh, Dean, that we got beat by the University of Georgia that year also. <laughs> I also was talking to Alan a little while ago about public speaking, and you get a lot of that in, in moot court competition, you get a lot of it in law school. I used to get very nervous when I'd get up to speak. Since I've been in the United States Senate, I get nervous when I'm being introduced. <laughs> Gordon, I appreciate that introduction. I was down in Miami, Florida about three weeks ago at a law enforcement seminar with a lot of different law enforcement agents from state, federal, and local level. The fellow who introduced me had never met me before, so he just told a story about the United States Senator and the way of introducing me. He said a certain Senator died, and he went up to the pearly gates, and exactly the same time he arrived, a Pope who had just died arrived at precisely the same moment. They confronted St. Peter together, and they both got their room assignments. They went off reasonably happy, and about two hours later, the Pope came back, and he was just indignant. He said, St. Peter, I really don't understand it. He said, I've lived a very good life for a long time. I've been a religious leader. And here I arrive at precisely the moment of a United States Senator. And I get to my room, and it's so tiny I can hardly even walk around. I was just invited over to his room, and he has a whole suite of rooms. And he said, I think it's been a very discriminating kind of practice that you have given us here. And uh, St. Peter looked at him a moment, he said, just hold on, I can explain everything. He said, we've had a lot of popes here, but this is the very first United States Senator. <laughs> I, I heard another story that doesn't have anything to do with my speech. I might figure out a way to tie it in, but nevertheless, it was about a big oil well that was on fire in Texas. And it was raging away, and the big oil company that owned the well decided that it was costing them something like $200,000 per hour. <clears throat> so they had an emergency meeting of the board of directors. None of the local fire departments could do anything with it. And they asked around the room, is there any expert that can put out oil well fires in this country? One fellow popped up, and he said, yes, definitely. There's a fellow named Red Adair. And Red Adair is a real expert. If you can just get him here, he can put out this fire. So the president of the company goes off and he calls Red Adair, gets him on the phone. Red says, yes, I've heard about the fire. It's one of the worst I've ever seen from what I've read about it. And the president says, well, how much will you charge us if you come put it out? He said, well, I'll have to say that being the, the fire, the kind of fire it is, the team of experts that I have to put together, I'll charge you $5 million. Well, the president gulps, and he says, I'll have to be back in touch with you. So he goes back to the boardroom, 
He reports the $5 million fee they all go up together and they ask around, is anybody else that we could call to see if we can get a better price? And one fellow that was on the board from Mexico pops up and he says, yes. He said, there is a fellow, I don't know a lot about him, but he has put out a few fires of this nature. His name is Garcia. He said, uh, well, let's, let's call him. So the president goes off, gets Garcia on the phone. He tells him about it. He says, how much would you charge to put out the fire? Garcia said, that's a real bad fire. He said, uh, I'll charge you uh, probably about $374. Well, <laughs> the president of the company immediately said, come on in, we'll, we'll be waiting for you. How will you get here? He said, well, I'll have to bring my family. They're part of my team. We'll come in a, in a pickup truck, and we'll be there early in the morning. So the next morning, they have thousands of people out <clears throat> ready to welcome Garcia. They know he's going to be the great hero. And he comes in with his pickup truck, and you see children all over the truck, the wife. They got blankets. They got chickens. They got everything on the truck. And about the time they expect him to stop at the crowd, he doesn't stop, he just keeps going. Pickup truck just goes right out in the middle of the fire. Just flames and smoke and so forth. Well, all of them are in horror. They know that Garcia and his entire family and the children and everything are gone. Well, they, they're all almost in mourning and then all of a sudden, in about 15 minutes, they see these blankets out there and they're beating on the fire and beating <laughs> on the fire. Chickens flapping their wings and so forth. And after about an hour, the fire starts going down a little bit. Another hour, it goes down a good bit more, and about the third hour, the fire is out. Garcia and his children come out. They've got soot all over them, smoke. They're coughing. Look like they're about dead. The president of the company, in great mood of generosity, says, Mr. Garcia, you contracted for $375, but you've done such a good job. We're going to give you an extra $25. So he writes out the check. And he said, why don't you have a few words to say for the crowd? This is probably the most money you've ever gotten. Garcia looked at him, he said, si, gracias. He said, uh, first thing I do with the money is get the brakes fixed on the pickup truck. <laughs> I, I think uh, probably the only way I can relate that is, is to say that in Washington, I think we need to get our brakes fixed. And perhaps we need to do that also in looking at the overall theme of Law Day and Law Week this year, which is the law, your access to justice. <clears throat> I know that many speakers and many people, when they're thinking about this theme, will think about different aspects of justice. Some will think about the civil side. Some will think about the rights of the defendant. Some will think about prison reform. So there'll be many different thoughts and ideas and speeches on this very worthwhile subject. I'd like to talk to you tonight about another aspect of justice, and that is the rights of the victim and the rights of society to see that our criminal justice system functions properly. Dean Beard, in his invitation which was sent out, said, and I quote him, our laws are made only after careful and thorough study. They reflect the traditions of the American people to do what is right, proper, and just. These laws in our courts serve as the guardians of our individual rights, end quote. Well, this is certainly a good expression of justice as it ought to be and as it is intended to be. I think it also expressed in many cases today how justice operates in our courts, fortunately. However, as we well know, I think we have to look at the record of the last few years and we have to realize that a lot of changes have taken place. We've had Watergate scandals, We've had exposés of FBI and CIA misdeeds. We've had indictments and convictions of the highest law enforcement officials in our land. We've had enemies lists drawn up in the highest offices of our land, and we've had Internal Revenue Service hit lists. Just since I've been in Washington, it was hard for me to believe, but just since I've been in Washington, since 1972, we've had six different attorney generals in office, six in a six-year period. These events, when you take them all together, have had a very serious effect on the morale of our law enforcement authorities and their ability to do their jobs. Moreover, Congress has responded with good intentions to insulate the system of justice that we have from future infringements of our rights. But with increasing frequency, I've observed that our protection of individuals from, fa from past law enforcement excesses has affected another of our rights, and that is the right of society to see that justice is done. Our system of criminal justice 
is based upon the premise that society has the capability and the resolve to arrest and convict the criminal while protecting his rights and while also protecting the rights of society. I'm convinced that you couple the, some of the court decisions we've had in the last 10 or 15 years with recent legislative enactments we've had in the last four or five years, well-intentioned though they may be, and in reaction to real legitimate excesses in law enforcement misdeeds, if you put all of this together, I believe we, had, we, we have weakened our system of criminal justice to the point where it is very difficult to detect, let alone indict and convict the modern day criminal with increasing sophistication and with tremendous resources behind what I call the professional criminal element in our country. None of us is prepared to shortchange or in any way dilute the constitutional rights of criminal defendants. But I think we must begin again to focus on the disturbing state of affairs in our law enforcement efforts. Professional criminals are really gamblers. First of all, they gamble that they won't get caught, and few do. Second, they gamble that if they do get caught, they will get out on low bail that they can make and they can flee the jurisdiction. And if caught again and tried and convicted, they gamble that they will get an easy judge who will give them a light sentence. And even if they are caught, even if they are convicted, even if they are sent to prison, they also gamble that they will get easy parole in a very quick time. If you summarize it all today, I would say that the professional criminal has the judicial odds in his favor. I don't think the odds are in the favor of the victim or the prosecutor or society as a whole. I believe Congress must also share the blame for the current situation. It seems, as Bob and Doug very well know, that any time a problem gets a lot of publicity, Congress seems bent on determining and showing and proving that it has a ready legislative remedy for whatever the problem is. The tremendous public focus on law enforcement and intelligent abuses and some of the knee-jerk legislative remedies we've had in the past few years have at worst crippled our law enforcement effort. At best, these, these actions have had a chilling effect on law enforcement and the criminal justice system's ability to assure that society itself <coughs> has access to justice. I'm Vice Chairman of the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. This subcommittee has somewhat of a notorious history, some of it good, some of it bad. Used to be the Gene McCarthy subcommittee, and Joe McCarthy subcommittee years ago. Then it, uh, <laughs> then it came under more responsible hands in the form of Senator John McClellan, who headed up most of the organized crime investigations in the late 1950s. <clears throat> Since then, it has been chaired by Senator Jackson, I've been vice chairman during a period of time where Senator Jackson has been running for president and also headed up the Energy Committee, so I've had my hands full and have done a lot of work in that regard. We've spent a lot of time on narcotics enforcement, trying to determine what's wrong with the federal effort, trying to determine whether the federal government is working with the state governments and the local governments in doing something about the drug traffic that has so, been such a plague to our country. We have been I would call it a rather critical subcommittee when it comes to looking at the federal narcotics efforts. We have not praised law enforcement. In fact, we've criticized very stringently some of the efforts at the Drug Enforcement Administration, known as DEA. We felt, and we issued a report two years ago and said so, that our federal authorities have been too preoccupied with what we call the street violators, the people who are out pushing on the street. They haven't been nearly involved enough in what I would call the major conspiracy cases, spending a lot more time but getting people further up the line. We've had very poor cooperation with state and local governments and state and local law enforcement authorities. And finally, we've had some very internal, some very serious internal integrity problems in DEA, which is almost inevitable when you're dealing with an area that involves the millions and millions of dollars that drug enforcement does. Finally, we have also seen that our drug enforcement efforts have never had a real goal. We asked Peter Benzinger when he became head of DEA about a year and a <coughs> half ago if he would please come in and tell us what the goal was. What should be the measure of success for the federal government in measuring our drug enforcement efforts? He did set some goals. Some of those goals are beginning to be met. One of the goals was a reduction in overdose deaths, which has a direct 
relationship with the purity of the heroin being brought into this country. And OD deaths have gone down about 50% in the last 18 months. But we have a long way to go. Well, in the course of all of this investigation, in the course of many, many days of hearings and talking to an awful lot of people in narcotics enforcement, I couldn't help, even though we were critical in many aspects, I couldn't help but begin to sympathize with the hard-pressed law enforcement officials and understand, and understand, even if I didn't agree, why they spent so much time trying to get people on the street who were pushing drugs at a very low level instead of spending thousands of hours necessary to go after the major conspirators, the people who are really making the profit. And I'll tell you why I was sympathetic with them and still am. There are many examples that we've run into that are rather shocking that I don't believe we stop and think about very often. In the past several years, the past four or five years, over 1,100 narcotics violators who have been arrested by law enforcement officials have been released on bail, but have never appeared at trial, and they are now fugitives from justice. In other words, the law enforcement officials made the case, they brought the case before grand jury, or they made an arrest, and the person posted bail and never showed up for trial. 1,100 of them are out there right now, never having been tried. In a recent case in New York, Two aliens, people from outside the country, not citizens, were arrested with eight pounds of heroin. At first, the bail, the bond was set at $250,000 each, which was reasonable. Then it was reduced to $10,000. They both got out on bond immediately, and they skipped the country. In the biggest conspiracy case ever made by the Drug Enforcement Administration, it's called the Alberta Cecilia Falcone case. There were 62 convictions in the United States. There were many more in Mexico. Forty-one of these convictions were what we call class one and class two violators. These are people who are really drug dealers, not people who are out on the street, but drug dealers. The average sentence of these people in the United States courts, and these were federal courts, the average sentence of this, these class one and class two violators was 1.6 years. 1.6 years. The law enforcement officials who made the case spent more time than that trying to bring them to the bars of justice. So we can begin to see some of the huge frustrations that are beginning to grow and grow and grow in the law enforcement community, and I think for good cause. In recent months, in fact, just about a month ago down in, in Puerto Rico, there was an arrest by the Drug Enforcement Administration of two people. One of them had 25 kilos of cocaine, the other one 50,000 pounds of marijuana. They found one man who had $5 million in cashier's checks in his right shoe, in his right shoe. About three weeks ago in Miami, Florida, there was an arrest made there, and they found $900,000 in small change, small bills in a locker. So what we're talking about is not the average run-of-the-mill kind of criminal. We're talking about people with huge resources, huge amounts of money. When you look at the Falcone case, which we got into in considerable detail, just in an oversight role, not in an investigatory role, we looked at that situation and we found that that organization had literally armies of people on the Mexican-American border. And drug enforcement agents could not even begin to make an arrest when those people were together because of the huge firepower they had. They had sophisticated rifles and guns and grenades and all kinds of ammunition. So this is the kind of traffic we're dealing with today. These are the stakes, and this is the kind of effort that the law enforcement officials have to make. Right now, my staff is looking into what we call money flow investigations. We've seen in the last uh, six or eight weeks, we've been looking at, uh, with the federal officials at some banks in South Florida. In one bank in South Florida, in nine accounts, we have seen $25 million pass in cash in the last two weeks. This money has been brought in in plastic garbage bags. So much money it takes tellers <coughs> days to count it. So this is the money flow investigations that are beginning to pay dividend. They've always gone after the narcotics before, but now, lo and behold, the federal authorities have figured out that the big boys always get the money, so now they're looking at the money, and I think that's a step in the right direction. But what about some of the laws that have been passed? There are a lot of good laws with good intentions. But I want to discuss just two or three of them tonight because we're going to have to take a real close look at some of these and we may have to do some patchwork on them. The Tax Reform Act of 1976 is a case and example. 
This law, for the first time, provided that the Internal Revenue Service cannot divulge taxpayer-provided information, not even to other law enforcement agencies. In one recent case, this happened last year, a taxpayer filed his tax return as required by law. He listed his occupation as, quote, illicit drug manufacturer, end quote. <laughs> His, his income he listed specifically as sales of narcotics. His losses he, li he listed as manufacturing equipment and raw materials which were seized in a raid by law enforcement officials. <laughs> his losses exceeded his income and he demanded a refund. <laughs> Would you believe that the Internal Revenue Service could not and has not to this date made that information known to the Drug Enforcement Administration because of the tax law of 1976? In another case, and this actually happened, the, in, the Internal Revenue Service, the Internal Revenue Service found heroin in a tax audit, and they could not make it known to Drug Enforcement Administration. So I think we need to take a serious look at this law. I think we also need to take a serious look at the Freedom of Information Act, which was recently passed. That has a very good purpose. Certainly no one, and I certainly wouldn't advocate repeal of that act. But we have to look at what it's doing. Right now, there are 50 full-time FBI agents who do nothing, who do nothing but provide information under the Freedom of Info Information Act. They have 200 analysts and 100 support staff to administer that act, simply providing information under that act. Now, when you look at the scope of this, this is twice as many full-time agents as we have working from the FBI in all of the organized crime investigations in the country. Twice as many of them are investigating, not investigating, but carrying out the mandates of law under the Freedom of Information Act. If you look at the field offices of the FBI, there are only 10% only of the field offices in this country have more agents in, in the field than are now administering the Freedom of Information Act. More importantly, sources are drying up, State and local law enforcement authorities are reluctant to share information because security cannot be guaranteed. There's less intelligence information being exchanged by law enforcement officials today than in a long, long time. And I think we have to back away, we who are lawyers, we who are legislators, and we have to look at these various acts and see what they're doing to our overall duty to provide access not just to the individual who is charged with a crime, but also to society. Now, this is a litany of horrors flowing directly from good faith efforts to correct past abuses. Needless to say, in my view, this situation is one that demands our attention. One of the things that I'm doing in the Permanent Investigating Subcommittee is to require and get our staff to do an awful lot of work in this area to accumulate a lot of information. One thing we're looking at, we're asking the Internal Revenue Service to come back and list all of the cases of patent law enforcement transgressions that they have known about that they have not been able to turn over to other agencies. We're also looking at the money flow situation, particularly in South Florida. I think that also increasingly will have some significance here in Georgia. We're also looking at the organized crime, the organized crime penetration of legitimate businesses, the organized crime penetration of some of our health plans, believe it or not. That's happened on the West Coast in several instances organized crime penetration of labor unions in the takeover in many cases of federal penitentiaries. The subcommittee is focusing particularly on the South Florida situation. Most of the narcotics for the Southeast United States are coming through South Florida now. We are beginning to see the Coast Guard work with the Treasury Department and work with the DEA and the FBI in an effort to curb that narcotics flow. The more success they have in South Florida, the more we're going to see narcotics flow into Georgia because these mother ships that bring in huge amounts of narcotics will simply come on up the coast. So this does have a direct application here. We're also looking into how some of the professional criminals can manipulate the system, how they can abuse the Freedom of Information Act, how they can abuse the Privacy Act. We're looking at the Atlanta penitentiary situation as a collateral matter. We've all known about some of the murders that have taken place in the Atlanta penitentiary in recent weeks. We have informants now who are beginning to tell us some of the inside stories on what's happening there. And I would have to say that it appears that organized crime has a real foothold in the Atlanta penitentiary. A good many of the activities 
that are happening outside are flowing from directions inside. As you begin to see some of this, as we can make information public, it will be shocking what takes place in our federal penitentiaries. We just had a case the other day where a narcotics informant was assigned to the Atlanta penitentiary within four hours after arriving, he was killed. So this, I think, is an indication of the seriousness and I think the growing problem we have with organized crime. The question that we as a society really must consider is how we can really maintain or at least develop a balance between the necessary protection of the legitimate rights of honest citizens and the repugnant manipulation of these protections by the hardcore criminal element. The laws which I have mentioned are positive in concept and we all can endorse and agree with their goals. But we must raise a serious question as lawyers, as judges, as people who are interested in our society. Are our present laws capable of protecting society and assuring that law-abiding citizens have access to justice? I don't advocate that we weaken the laws that assure the rights of all of us. In my view, however, the pendulum may have swung too far to the detriment of law enforcement and ultimately to the rights of law-abiding citizens. Access to justice must not be limited to the accused. This term must encompass the duty of our criminal justice system to provide protection to our personal safety and property and to protect the society as a whole from the professional criminals. Members of the legal profession cannot afford to leave the determination of these matters really to the law enforcement officials, to the legislators, and to the general public. I think it, you all as lawyers, including me as a lawyer, we all have a duty as officers of the court to actively participate in the improvement effort. If lawyers are not vitally involved in improving some of the situations that exist now, the pendulum may swing so fast and may be dictated in a <coughs> swing by public opinion that is, in the recent past, in other instances, it may be impossible to stop this pendulum in the middle. In America, the pendulum inevitably swings. Our great task is to see that it does not swing to extremes in either direction. The role I'm suggesting for lawyers is not a simple one. I do believe, though, that it is a vital one. In effect, I am saying that whether you practice criminal law or civil law, or whatever you may do in the practice of law, it is important that you become knowledgeable on issues which affect our entire criminal justice system. Justice is the foundation of our free society. Justice, though, must be more than a theory. Justice must be capable of protecting people and property, not just in theory, but also in practice. Daniel Webster once said, and I quote him, justice is the great interest of man on earth. It is the ligament which holds civilized beings and civilized nations together, end quote. Our task as lawyers is to see that both individuals and society as a whole has access to this justice. Thank you very much. Senator Nunn for sharing your comments with us tonight. Uh, before I introduce the other members of the Law Review, I'd like to do two things. One is mention another moot court judge we left off the list, and that's Judge Jeb Tanksley and Mrs. Tanksley. And second, I'd like to do a little boasting about the Law Review that Dean Beard didn't do. Uh, just putting out a regular issue with the Law Review generally involves a tremendous amount of work, but this year the Volume 12 Managing Board decided to undertake two special projects. First, we're almost to the printer with the last manuscripts of a special issue, the articles of which will be devoted entirely to the right of privacy. The issue is built around the Sibley Lecture delivered here in March by Professor Richard Posner of the University of Chicago, and the planning and constructing of the issue, which will include approximately 10 articles taken virtually all the time of our two articles editors for the last three months. We expect the issue to be out sometime in early June, and we think the privacy issue is particularly appropriate for the Georgia Law Review, since Georgia was the first state in the country to recognize uh, 
private right of action in tort for invasion of privacy. Our other project is the second of what we hope will be an annual series for an annual feature in the review. That's the developments in Georgia Law Note. This year, the note deals with debtor and creditor rights and has required the efforts of six writers, six student staff writers, and one notes editor. The note will be by far the biggest student undertaking the Georgia Law Review has ever attempted, and it'll be published as our fourth issue due out sometime at the end of the summer. In addition to these two projects, we've tried to include in our issues a variety of topics of local, national, and international interest. And we've also attempted, successfully we think, to present a wide variety of points of view in both our student pieces and our articles. We'd like to thank everybody who contributed those pieces, especially our local faculty members whose articles we've published in Volume 12. And tonight we have with us four members of the faculty who have either been published so far or will be published soon in Volume 12. And if they'll somehow let their presence be known, I'd like to recognize them. They are Professor Ronald Ellington, whose article on Waiver of Venue was published in 12-2. And Professor Donald Wilkes, whose article on Habeas Corpus Relief in Georgia was also published in 12 -2. And Professor Rick Holmes, whose article on Insurance will appear in 12-4. And finally, the prolific professor R. Perry Sintel, Jr., whose article on extraterritorial power of municipal corporations we published in 12-1, and whose article on local government home rule will be in 12-4. <laughs> We're especially indebted to the faculty members who have supported the review this year through contrib con contributing their articles. And we'd also like to express our gratitude to another member of the faculty who's done a great deal for us this year. He's our faculty advisor, Professor Richard Wellman. At this time, I'd like to recognize the other members of the managing board of the Law Review for Volume 12. There are executive editors. Well, if you'll please hold your applause until all is stood. Uh, executive editors, G.R. Smith. The managing editors, Randy Bart. Randy was supervisor and organizer of all the moot court and law review people who organized the banquet tonight. He asked me not to mention that unless things were going smoothly at this point. <laughs> the research editors are Jerry Chapman and Kay Deming. The articles editors are Jack Capers and Benna Solomon. Jack and Ben are the two editors who have put together the privacy issue. The notes editors are Don Hackney. Don is also the development editor who worked so hard that we almost had a problem finding anyone who would take over his job for next year. And Ted Cassinger <coughs> and Ruth Knox. And the decisions editors are Kaylin Jones, Polly Plimpton Smith, and Bill Withrow. That's the volume 12 managing board. Now we'd like to distribute the certificates to the staff. Uh, the staff members for volume 12 were Carol Baird, Wayne Brown, <coughs> Kevin Bice, Randy Cadenhead, Val Caproni, <coughs> Richard Carlson. Am I moving too fast? <laughs> Hugh Davenport. Jane Fugit, Joan Grafstein, <coughs> Bill Hartley, and 
Wayman Johnson. Kata Kilgore. Edward Krugman. Jill Lanier. <coughs> Hal Meeks. Bob Scholes. Dorothy Summerill, Wayne Thorpe, Mary Catherine Walton, Robert Whitlow, Alan Willingham, and Reese Wilson. That was the volume 12 staff. We also have two special certificates to hand out. If these people will come forward, John Carr. John Carr was a senior editor this year. He helped us out with some of the editing on 12-2. He was graduated last quarter and will be leaving soon for practice in Washington, D.C. And another is Helen Fulton. Helen was our uh, executive secretary this year, and I don't think <coughs> enough people realize how much work is involved in being executive secretary for the law review she's done an excellent job for us this year and we're sorry to say that she'll be leaving us in june she's been accepted to law school at lewis and clark law school and will enroll there as a first year student in september thank you Finally, I'd like to recognize our new managing board, selected for volume 13, and they'll take over at the end of the year. If you'll just stand as I call out your names. The articles editors are Joan Grafstein and Ed Krugman. The research editors are Val Caproni and Wayne Thorpe. The notes editors are Richard Carlson Kata Kilgore, and Alan Willingham. Decisions editors are Jane Fugit, Wayman Johnson, and Dorothy Summerell. Managing editors, Joe Lanier. Executive editor is Hugh Davenport. And the new editor-in-chief is Kevin Bice. Congratulations. Thank you all very much, Gordon. Alan, you only think that the uh, law review part's over. Uh, I think Polly Clinton Smith and Kevin Bice might have something more to add to this. Well, last year, you, as you've heard, the um, Law Review ambitiously put out five issues, and not to be outdone by our predecessors, we've decided to put out a fifth issue ourselves. However, um, and we decided to make this issue a special symposium on the true picture of what goes on in Law Review. We could only afford, however, to, make, to print two copies, though. So on behalf of the staff and the rest of the managing board, I'd like to present these two special copies of the Georgia Law Review to Alan and GR.
I'm almost afraid to. As the banquet approached, we, of course, had to worry about what to present our fearless leader. And the uh, resounding answer was the, to frame the masthead of the 7778 Law Review. By this, I guess we've conclusively established that uh, the catchword for the new managing board is originality. Uh, I, uh, I did make an informal poll of the members of the new managing board, and there were basically two sentiments that I they wanted me to express. In all sincerity, we do recognize that uh, it's much easier to continue a great tradition than to have to build one on our own. We appreciate uh, you're making our job that much easier. Secondly, we would uh, greatly appreciate it if you could have your desk cleared and offices <laughs> by next Monday. <laughs> uh, I'm speechless, but thanks to uh, the Volume 12 Managing Board and thanks and good luck to the Volume 13 Managing Board. Very much. Gordon. <coughs> That's a little difficult to follow, but we'll try with the moot court section. I think the first order of business is to recognize the winners and runners-up of our intra-school competitions, the finals of which were held this afternoon. I think it's appropriate that both of the finalist teams in our Talmadge competition for second and third year students have one member from Law Review and one member from the moot court program. The winners of that competition today, in an extremely close round, were David Harrison and Val Caproni, the runners up were Jane Barwick and Ruth Knox. If y'all would stand, please, and I think they deserve a round of applause. As Dean Baird noted earlier, we've had a successful year. We entered six intercollegiate competitions, and we won or placed in every one of them. If you add up our total competitive rounds, it comes out to something around 40 wins and 11 losses. And as Dean Beard told me earlier in the year, when it comes to moot court, he's Vince Lombardi. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think that even Vince Lombardi might be happy with that record in moot court. But much of this credit has to go to the moot court board. They put in long hours in the fall choosing the teams. They put in long hours during the winter and spring coaching and developing their teams and preparing for these competitions. And at this time, I'd like to recognize each member of the Moot Court Board and have them come forward and receive their certificates if they would. First of all, David Curry, who is coaching coordinator for the Interstate team. <laughs> Rick Story, who is coaching coordinator for the Jessup Cup International Competition. Stan Richards, who is coach and coordinator for the Holderness Invitational Competition. <laughs> Diane Marger, who is coordinator for the Southern Competition. <laughs> Holly Pritchard, who is coach and coordinator for the Wagner Labor Law Competition. Mary Helen Moses, who is coach and coordinator for the American Bar Association competition. <laughs> William Daniel, who served as vice chairman for the Moot Court Board. John Stell and Charlie Tanksty, Tanksley, who served as coordinators for the Talmadge competition. Finally, Lark Ingram and Carolyn Tatum, who are coordinators for the Russell competition. <laughs> Let me backtrack a little as I neglected to announce the winners of the Russell competition. The winner of the Russell co competition could not be with us tonight was Susan Barker. The runner-up in that was Kirk McAlpin, who is here tonight, I think. Kirk, would you stand, please?
again, as Dean Beard said, our national team was as good or better than we've ever had. They won the regional competition. Richard Bethay was named the best oralist in the regional competition. They went on to be quarterfinalists in the nationals. And out of more than, I don't think, I believe it was more than just over 80 schools that entered, their brief finished eighth place. I wish when I called your names, you'd come up and get your certificates also. John Thompson. Richard Bethay. And Susan Warren. Now, certainly the people most responsible for this excellent record this year were the team members themselves who were chosen out of the second year class and all our second, well, not all of them are second year students, but most of them are. They are certainly the ones most responsible for this record. And I wish, as I called each team, that you would stand and remain standing until I call the next team. First of all, I'm gonna recognize the American Bar Association team. And first, let me apologize to them. Those of you who were at the uh, arguments today may have noted that the that competition was not recognized in the program. That was an oversight on my part, and certainly they were deserving of it. So I'll recognize them first and try to make up to them for it. <laughs> we sent two teams to that competition. One team made up of David Ware, Nancy Reeves, and Glenn Johnson. David Ware was the best oralist in two rounds of that competition. Nancy Reeves was the best oralist in one round of that competition, and Glenn Johnson was the best oralist in another round of that competition and the team reached the semifinals. We had another team that we sent. We had another team at the competition consisting of Mike Morris, Molly McKibben, and Mary Wilkes. The interstate competition this year, Georgia was represented. We had two teams at that competition also, as did uh, Emory and Mercer. One team, made up of Bert Tillman, Jane Barwick, and Joe Lanier. They were the overall winners of that competition. <laughs> Our other team, Barry Harris, Pat McMahon, and Frank Wilson won the best brief in that competition. <laughs> Our team for the Wagner Labor Law Competition uh, put on by the New York Law School consisted of Patty Warren, Bill DeGolian, and Mike Sheehan. Uh, in a nationwide competition with over 40 teams, they finished fifth in that competition. In the Holderness National Invitational Competition, Georgia was represented by Mary Hall, David Harton, and Neil Gordon. They finished third in that competition. And finally, in the Jessup Cup International Competition, Georgia's team was Griff Doyle, David Harrison, Eddie Kilgore, and Gene Major. They tied for first place on just about everything they could tie on, and the judges, after a lot of consultation, somehow decided that we ended up second place. <laughs> However, David Harrison also got the second best oralist in that competition. Now, before I sit down, I, I would like to recognize next year's chairman of the Moot Court Board and next year's national team. If they would stand, please, and be recognized. Next year's national team will be made up of Patty Warren, David Harrison, and Jane Borwick. And we wish them the best of luck next year. <laughs> next year's chairman, and I wish him a lot of luck, will be Bert Tillman. Again, I'd like to thank the board for the incredible amount of work that they put in and made all this possible. I'd like to congratulate the teams on their outstanding performances, and I'd like to wish the new board a lot of good luck. Uh, I understand that Diane Marger has an announcement to make at this time.
Gordon probably knew that I wasn't going to change my style and let him get the last word in tonight. So following that tradition, being chairman of the Moot Court Board, as Bert will find out, is probably one of the most difficult jobs. Those people who are oralists have a tendency to possibly have some ego, some conflicts. The chairman of the board is responsible for not only dealing with the third year students who equally have egos and problems, but with the second year members and all the members of the team as well as the administration and making sure that we're funding for all of our fine programs. And so we'd like to offer an award to Gordon for doing an outstanding job as chairman this year. <laughs> I'll present them. We, we were going to give Gordon some of his usual study aids, but he already has all the Gilberts in town. <laughs> so we thought that we'd change his style for his future life and working for Judge O'Kelly. And so we have a few real live textbooks that he will probably read before he starts work at the end of the summer. <laughs> You, Alan, I don't quite know what to say, but uh, all I'm going to do is introduce our hardworking and great faculty advisor, Mr. Kurtz, who has some presentations at this time. Contrary to what Diane says, the faculty always gets the last word. <laughs> Some more than <laughs> for those of you, who, for those of you who heard my introduction last year, the introduction of me by Ken Kendrick, in which he simply just said "go," <laughs> I'm not sure that wasn't a better introduction than what Gordon gave me. But you'll pardon me if I'm a little bit nervous because it's very rare that a, a faculty member, a law professor, gets to talk to a bunch of people who have their heads up instead of down. <laughs> and also a group of people who I won't get to grade on the final. But actually, it's a, it's a, it's a real privilege and a pleasure for me to, to honor this year's group of third-year students who participated in, in moot court work, not only because they've put so much hard work and effort into their, their time at Georgia, but also I, I feel a particular pride in honoring this year's group of students who came to the Georgia Law School at the same time I did. And fortunately for the profession, they will be entering the private profession while I will remain at the Georgia Law School. <laughs> I like to think that both the profession and the law school will benefit from that in different ways. The, the particular honor that I have the privilege of bestowing tonight is the, the honor of membership in Order of the Barristers. Order of the Barristers is the Phi Beta Kappa of appellate advocacy, the Order of the Coif, if you will, of the appellate advocacy part of our law school program. It was founded in 1965 at the University of Texas as an internal organization. And uh, in 1971, it became a national organization. And the University of Georgia was a charter member of the Order of the Barristers. And it now has chapters in 76 premier law schools within the country. It, its purposes are, in the words of its constitution, to honor and encourage oral advocacy and brief writing skills. Also, it recognizes outstanding moot court service and ability. And likewise, it provides for an interchange of ideas and constructive suggestions for improvement of moot court programs. And the Georgia moot court program, <coughs> I think, is one of the outstanding moot court programs in the country, certainly one of the most ambitious moot court programs in the country. Uh, I did some research in the area as part of my publisher parish obligation. <laughs> well, pardon me. <laughs> and noted that the University of Georgia has sent a team to the national finals in the last four years of the national moot court competition. There are only three schools in the country, three schools out of the 160 AALS schools in the country that can make that claim. And Georgia is one of those schools. A 
I like to think it's from fine faculty advising, <laughs> but that's probably attributable to Mac Player, who preceded me and set up the program. And as advisor, it gives me a distinct pleasure to recognize those six students who we'd like to honor tonight as, and induct as members of Order of the Barristers. Now, this honor reflects the work that they have done in various aspects of the Moot Court program, both internal in the, in the Russell competition and the Talmadge Law Day competition, and in the, their service on the Moot Court Board and as appellate advocacy advisors, and likewise in intercollegiate competition in representing the University of Georgia so ably in interscholastic <coughs> competition. So I'd like to, to introduce these people and have them stand and be recognized uh, and have you save your applause until the end. The first honoree tonight was a runner-up in the Law Day competition last year. He was a member of the ABA team that won the regionals and were quarterfinalists in the national competition. He was a member of the national moot court competition team, which placed eighth in the country last year, last fall, which wrote the eighth best brief. He was also named as the best oralist in the regional competition in that tournament. I'd like to recognize Richard Bethay. You were supposed to hold your applause, but I gave such a great introduction, I can understand why you were applauding. <laughs> the next honoree was the winner of the Russell competition in his first year here at Georgia, a member of the intrastate team, a coach of the state champion 1978 intrastate team, and now he's grinning, so I'll have to introduce him, David Curry. <laughs> Our next honoree was a member of the ABA team last year, was a coach for the ABA teams this year. She was an appellate practice instructor under the able guidance of Professor Kurtz this year, <laughs> and was always there when needed, according to Gordon. Now, I don't know exactly what that means. <laughs> Perhaps Gordon would like to explain that. Miss Mary Helen Moses. <laughs> Our next honoree was a runner-up in Russell competition. Thank you very much, Ambassador Young, President Davidson, <coughs> Dean Baird. President Fletcher, ladies and gentlemen, or should I say persons, uh, without the support of the Georgia lawyers and so many of you here that have been my lifelong friends, I would never have gotten anywhere in the American bar, and I do thank you for that, for that support over many years. While well, sitting in the barber's chair the other day, it occurred to me that barbers now charge me almost eight times as much for a haircut as when I began practice, and I only have a third as much hair. <laughs> this seems highly unfair, and I would certainly protest if it weren't for the stimulating intellectual atmosphere of the barbershop. Needless to say, I would not have encountered the Playboy magazine article in which Ralph Nader calls for a bill of rights for sports fans. <laughs> had it not been for the barber calling it to my attention. I hope that last statement doesn't seriously weaken the credibility of the rest of my remarks. <laughs> anyway, Nader's Bill of Rights has, as you might suspect, 10 articles which seem to cover most of the complaints that fans have made recently against the people who run both professional and amateur sports, and possibly some they haven't made. That's part of the course for Nader. For example, Article 4 of Mr. Nader's bill seems to ensure, quote, that food sold at sporting events is reasonably priced and well prepared. Well, I think that's fine. I'm very much in favor of having reasonably priced and well prepared food at the ball game. What I'm not entirely sure of 
is whether or not I have a God-given inalienable right to such food, and whether that right is protected by the United States Constitution and the laws of the land. And if it is not so given and so protected, what makes it a right? The question isn't as frivolous as it sounds. There's a growing tendency in this country to regard as rights a variety of benefits never imagined by the founding fathers. A high school student felt that she had the right to attend her graduation ceremony. This particular student had been barred by the school for disciplinary reasons after hitting a teacher in the face with a pie. A man felt he had a right to damages from his former employer, charging that he was driven to alcoholism by his experience with the company. A 19-year-old girl who had injured herself five years earlier, driving her car off a dock, sued her parents for failing to warn her adequately. Well, maybe these are rights, maybe not. I only know that the term right has become a very large umbrella of late, so big, in fact, that it is increasingly difficult to tell a right from a wrong, and that could be dangerous. In fact, it could irreparably damage the civil rights movement, which up to now has given us some of the most important social achievements of the 20th century. Civil rights, 20 years ago, the phrase had a ring to it. The Supreme Court had given us Brown against the Board of Education, and blacks were using it as a fulcrum to obtain due process of law. In those days, the issues at stake were the right to a fair trial, the right to vote, the right to equal use of public facilities. I recall very well, as I'm sure you do, how difficult of attainment those rights could be. Only after a great deal of suffering by blacks and the concerted effort of federal courts, the administration, and of various sympathetic organizations and individuals were the worst of these abuses overcome. Incidentally, the American Bar was one such organization. In 1963, the ABA, encouraged and supported by President Kennedy, helped to establish a Lawyers' Committee for Civil Rights. I'm proud to say that I was a member of the Executive Committee of that group. Local committees were organized in several cities, and with the co cooperation of the Mississippi Bar Association and individual lawyers in Mississippi who did not want to get individually involved, we sent into Mississippi lawyers from other states to defend unjustly accused civil rights workers. The committee still functions, incidentally, in Mississippi, but happily not to the extent that it once had to. The achievement of civil rights for blacks was only a beginning. In succeeding years, Supreme Court decisions extended protection of the laws, as defined by the 14th Amendment, to increasing numbers of people. In 1962, Baker against Carr required that rotten boroughs of state legislatures be reapportioned to reflect population shifts. In 1966, federal power to regulate state elections was upheld. Also in 1966 came Miranda, a notable advance in judicial protection of criminal defendants. Women's rights under the law were recognized in Reed against Reed, 1971. No person may be denied equality before the law because of sex, said the court. Prisoners were granted the right to, cause to, the right to law libraries in 1973 and to visits from attorney's assistants in 1974. The important distinction to be made from, on the one hand, between my right to a haircut at a price commensurate with the amount of hair to be cut, and on the other hand, the right of every person's vote to be equal, is that the latter is clearly based in the Constitution and the former is not. And any attempt by me to expand my right to a low-priced haircut through litigation will contribute to the ever-increasing congestion of our courts. It would also put my right in direct conflict with the right of the barber to a decent income. I think an acid test for what is and is not 
a right should be whether there are alternate means available to resolve the dispute. For example, I can ask my good wife Teddy to trim my hair, and Ralph Nader can pack his own lunch. If enough people do this, I think the mechanism of the marketplace might soon bring down the cost of haircuts and improve the quality of frankfurters. Instead of the marketplace, many people have turned to the legislature and Congress, and they have also helped to broaden the definition of rights. For example, the environmental laws restricted the right of businessmen in favor of the presumed rights of society as a whole. The consumer movement, which came to prominence with Ralph Nader's attack upon the auto companies, now extends to virtually every other kind of company as well. Here, too, the individual rights of businessmen to produce in their own way what they believed their customers wanted gave way to what came to be regarded as the overriding good of the majority. The benefits of reducing environmental pollution and increasing consumer protection and other legislated rights cannot be denied. But some of the side effects have been unfortunate. One is the burgeoning federal bureaucracy needed to enforce the new laws, a bureaucracy that is becoming increasingly oppressive, if only because bureaucracies, once established, must act to justify their existence. And so we have had regulations, such as the one from OSHA, requiring that farmers provide private toilets, washing facilities, and drinking water within a five-minute walk of all field workers. I believe this is vulgarly referred to as a little house on the prairie rule. <laughs> Another regulation linked up, by, linked up automobile seat belts and ignition thereby preventing the car from starting, unless the belt was buckled. Next, I'm told, all tires may come with self-measuring gauges to prevent flats. And after that, we'll probably have the bag that inflates on collision. Eventually, perhaps, all automobiles will be nearly accident-proof, but nobody will be able to afford one. And if that happens, will we not have effectively denied many the right to the transportation needed to get them to their jobs. The second consequence of these new movements is even more ominous. It is a growing tendency on the part of the individual to demand compensation from someone for almost any kind of misfortune that befalls him. One social researcher calls it the psychology of entitlement. For example, one man lost a finger operating his power lawnmower and sued the manufacturer. It didn't matter to him, and it apparently didn't matter to the jury either, that his injury occurred when he was using the lawnmower to cut a hedge. He was entitled to compensation for his suffering. The most obvious results of this trend toward drop of the hat litigation are economic. Juries hand down large judgments, seemingly regardless of blame, Insurance companies pay the judgments and then raise their premiums to the insured. Finally, the insured pass along the higher premiums to the rest of us in prices of their products and services. So, in a way, it's a kind of taxation, even if a highly inflationary and inefficient kind. But there is another more serious consequence of our increasing litigiousness, one that could make us, should make us ask ourselves, whether, as a society, we can continue to afford much longer the luxury of believing we have a right to full and social economic protection, whatever the circumstance. Our government commissions, and especially our courts, are overburdened. Complaints to civil rights commissions in the past three years have doubled. The U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has a backlog of 130,000 claims and is years behind in processing them. In local courts, according to a new survey of 21 major cities, the median time between filing and the start of jury trials on civil cases ranges from 403 to 1,361 days. 
in Cook County alone, Chicago, the circuit court's backlog of personal injury cases was 55,000 last November, up 6,000 from the previous year. The federal courts are in trouble too. The administrative office of the U.S. courts reports a staggering year-to-year -year increase in cases filed under the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and subsequent statutes. One federal judge has been quoted as saying, discrimination cases are all he sees. And U.S. Attorney General Griffin Bell goes so far as to say, the quality of justice dispensed by our federal court system is beginning to deteriorate. And that is serious indeed. If we as a society persist in believing that any problem at all can be resolved by government new case, our judicial fiat, the burden of our government and our judicial system can only increase. If we persist in believing that somewhere there is a mysterious they who will pay for everything, then eventually that burden must become intolerable. For the society we live in is a precariously balanced and delicate instrument founded upon the belief that rights and wrongs are distinguishable and that, in the end, fairness and honesty will prevail. Fairness and honesty are finding it increasingly hard to prevail in a judicial system clogged with frivolous lawsuits, and which description may or may not include Andy Young's daughter's right to sue for two bubble gum. <laughs> I'll give you an example. A businessman recently bragged to a friend of mine in a large city how a very wealthy but unscrupulous acquaintance of his makes use of the terrible gluck in his city's courts. The man, a builder, buys products and services from small companies without paying for them. Instead, when they finally call for their money, he says, sue me. He knows that even if the person does sue, he will unquestionably settle for less than the full amount often one half or one third, rather than wait three to five years for a resolution of the case. This kind of chicanery is increasing. It could result in a backlash of public fervor so intense that not only frivolous rights, but hard-won genuine rights as well could be eroded. Look at it this way. The theme for Law Day this year is the law, your access to justice. If these trends continue, this will become a mockery. It already is for those victimized by that wealthy builder. As lawyers, we are responsible for providing access to the justice system. We can only do it by preventing abuse of the system. Does this mean we should discourage clients from bringing suits? Yes, if the suit is frivolous, or if there are alternate means of resolution available, or if there is no significant legal principle to be established. But we must do more than that. We must make a concerted effort to increase public understanding of our justice system. And we must continue to work to see that people who need the protection of the courts most have access to them. These goals are being actively pursued by the American Bar Association to increase public understanding of the role of the lawyer in our justice system, for example. The ABA recently published a new booklet called The American Lawyer, How to Choose and Use One. And we have done major work on minor dispute resolution. For example, helping provide the means for keeping your irritation over your neighbor's barking dog out of the courtroom while still giving you justice. To continue the meaningful progress that has been made over the last 20 years, the ABA House of Delegates in New Orleans recently recommended legislation that would permit courts and administrative agencies to award reasonable attorney's fees to private parties who bring suits against the government, providing a substantial public benefit results are an important public right is enforced. Also at New Orleans, the ABA Board of Governors voted to establish a five-man task force on legal rights of the elderly and authorized it to prepare recommendations for a public service program on behalf of the elderly. 
Previously, the Board of Governors has endorsed the work of the Legal Services Corporation, a federally funded agency that for the past four years has been seeking ways to increase legal services for the poor. The ABA is also encouraging increased emphasis upon lawyer referral services by local bar associations, and specifically endorses appointments of lay persons to the supervisory committees for such services and the publishing of biographical information about panel lawyers serving on those services. The law, your access to justice, this stirring law day theme will only have meaning if we unclog the courts so that cases can be heard promptly. It will only have meaning if the American people know when and how to avail themselves of lawyers. I suggest that everyone's access to justice is denied when we try to gratify every personal desire through litigation. I submit that we must more carefully separate rights from wrongs and that the Constitution is one way to do this. Legislative restraint is another, and letting non-legal institutions resolve many controversies is a third. Unless we do, your insistence upon your rights will deny both of us access to justice and wrong everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Spann. You know, I think uh, when we are thinking of the importance of people, it's somewhat our ideas are formed based upon our own perspective. And in the morning when we are shaving, I'm sure the person we see in the mirror is the most important person in our own eyes. I know that the most important person here today, from my perspective, is to my immediate left. And with all due respect to Ambassador Young and Dean Beard and Mr. Spann and President Davidson, I overlook the second most important person here today. And will Gwen Young, I mean Gwen Wood, excuse me, Gwen Wood, where is Gwen? Gwen, Gwen keeps the law school running. And I know she keeps the law school association going. And we appreciate Gwen so much. And Gwen, please stand. We'd like to. I want to thank everyone for being here today. I want to thank everyone who participated in the program. I want to express our special appreciation to Mr. Spann for coming and our special appreciation to Ambassador Young for participating in this Law Day affair. Thank you so much. Oh, one more thing. That's all. I want to remind everyone of our annual meeting, which will be on Friday morning, June 2nd, at the DeSoto Hilton Hotel at the uh, Bar Association meeting this year. Thank you.